Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Sammy, and this is Drive It Like You Hacked It. Um, this is a, basically a fun talk I've, I've just been continuously working on and improving um, as I'm doing research in a couple of different areas. Um, a couple really fun areas for me have been uh, vehicles. Um, vehicles, radio, hardware. And uh, we're going to focus a, a little bit on some of that stuff, which is really fun to me. Um, we'll cover some web stuff as well and, and try to bring it all together in a fun way. So we all love Nicolas Cage, right? Yeah? OK. I love Nicolas Cage. So I saw Gone in 60 Seconds. It's like one of my favorite movies. So I've spent my entire life trying to be like him. Um, so as Gone in 60 Seconds happens, you know, basically Nick Cage is going around stealing cars. I hope I didn't spoil that for anyone. But uh, to do that, the first thing you need to do is you need to get into a garage, which has like some really cool cars. So in the last year, I've been looking at how can I break into garages? Like, how do garages work? And garages uh, are pretty cool. We all have sort of, we've all seen the clicker, right? Little garage clicker. All right, I have one here. So I started learning about how these things worked. And my goal was to break into my own garage. Um, I have like a, I'm in a condo unit, so there's a bunch of different cars down there, and I wanted to see how this thing works. So I started learning a little bit about radio frequency and how um, radios and communicating with devices like garage door openers works. So the first thing, we're going to basically go in depth here, and I'm going to show you how, how this stuff works. We'll actually do some live demonstrations. Um, the first thing you do when learning about something with radio is there's something really cool. Any device in the US that transmits, that actually transmits radio frequency, has to have an FCC ID. So if you actually pull out your phone, all of our phones actually will have an FCC ID on the back here. So like on my iPhone, I, I see an FCC ID. So same thing with this garage door opener, which opens my garage. So what we can do is we can actually take one of these things and open up our garage. Um, and if we look at the FCC ID, the cool thing about the FCC is what they do is they regulate uh, transmission in the US. So if you want to transmit on a radio frequency, the FCC has to allow that device or manufacturer to do it. Um, and what we can do is all of the information about that ID is actually public information. So you can actually go to the FCC's website, which is really, really hard to use, um, and search for one of these IDs. Fortunately, someone named Dominic Spill has created a website called FCC.io, which I use all the time. And basically, on FCC.io, you can just type in the identifier back on either this garage door opener or your garage door itself or your phone. So if you actually pull out your phone and you can look up the FCC ID and you can learn all about what your phone transmits on. It's actually very cool. Uh, and inside of there, we'll see a few things. So the first thing we see is uh, often you'll see pictures of the actual device, both the outside on the left here and the inside. So you'll actually see inside of that circuit. Um, this is really cool if you're trying to look up information on, say, a device that you don't necessarily have access to, or a device that might be out of your price range, or uh, a device that's not released yet, right? something that's coming out. You can actually go here, and you can learn a ton of information. You could probably produce, you know, vulner you can probably discover vulnerabilities or issues with the device before it even comes out. It's pretty incredible. So here's an example of actually my garage door, or door opener. I looked it up. And the first thing we see here is we see kind of like where it came from. It came from China, obviously. Um, and you also see the, the range here, the frequency range. So this is the frequency that it communicates on. And on this one, it says the lower frequency is 390 megahertz and the upper is 390 megahertz. So that means this communicates on one, one frequency, 390 megahertz, which is pretty cool. Um, so what else we see on, on the FCC? We see stuff like uh, they have a cover letter, always a nice little formal letter they write. Um, external photos like we saw, internal photos, a couple different things. One of the, the more interesting areas is the, um, the test report. So what the FCC does is they hire someone to come out and actually test your device. Because the thing with, the, with frequencies is we're essentially sharing the spectrum. Like you don't want a device to just constantly transmit out and prevent other devices from working. For example, if I just held this garage door thing, if this were just transmitting all the time, it may prevent other garage door uh, openers from working. Um, and you wouldn't want to interfere with, say, someone across the street. So they do all these tests to ensure that it transmits on the frequencies it's allowed to, not more powerful than it should, uh, so on and so forth. So if we pull this up, we can see like the internal report. We can actually often see um, a, a spectrograph of uh, actually recording of that. 
uh, of the radio signal transmitted by the device. And there are some different devices I use to actually uh, listen to this kind of stuff. One of the devices is really cool. Um, it's HackRF. Uh, it's capable of receiving and trans transmitting from 1 megahertz all the way up to 6 gigahertz. It's a really wide range, totally open source, open hardware, a couple hundred dollars. Um, it can also transmit, which is really interesting. People have done some really crazy stuff with this thing. Uh, for example, spoofing GPS. I mean, people have literally spoofed GPS using this device or similar devices and have made ships go off course. Ships literally going off course because what are they depending on? They're depending on GPS. How's GPS works? It's from radio signals getting sent from satellites down to the Earth, and we're using that to like figure out where we are. And someone comes along and transmits a signal, and you think you're somewhere else, or you think you're just going somewhere else. I mean, the, the amount of dependency that we have on these radio signals is massive, and it's growing every single day. So this is another reason that this is like such an interesting thing, and, and, and I'm so interested in this right now. And now HackRF, you may say, okay, well, I don't know anything about radio, and I know very little about radio personally. But uh, you can do some pretty simple things. For example, if you're dealing with something that uses a, a fixed transmission, um, something that where it's like a password. So if you open your garage door opener, a lot of our garage door openers basically have a bunch of dip switches, which is essentially a password, and that opens your garage. Now, if you don't know someone's, like, if I were trying to exploit someone's garage and trying to break in, what I might do is I might um, record that signal and replay it. And HackRef can do that. Now, not all devices are capable of recording and replaying. Uh, often, you need to know a lot more information about the signal, which we'll learn in a bit. But with literally two commands, you can record and then replay. Kind of like recording, a, you know, taking a microphone and a speaker um, and re reproducing some signal. Now, this will work in some scenarios, not in all scenarios. For example, cars will use something called rolling codes. We'll go over that later, where the password's changing, kind of like uh, Google Authenticator or 2FA. Right? You might get uh, a 2FA is essentially a rolling code where every time you get a new identifier or a new password to log into something. Another device I use is RTL SDR. This thing's awesome. I have it right here. Um, it's basically uh, another antenna. It's a soft SDR means software defined radio. Um, RTL it's from Realtek. And software-defined radio is, well, HackRF is also a software-defined radio. It allows you to use software and inexpensive hardware to analyze the radio spectrum and also often transmit. RTL SDR is great because it's like $20 on Amazon. So you can go right now for 20 bucks, get into it, you know, start learning, um, and you can do so much. You can see planes going overhead. There was actually uh, someone in LA who, did, who has been recording planes. So it's public transmission. Whenever a plane is flying, it's sending radio signal of where it is, of its GPS coordinates and information about it, um, its unique name. And he started mapping it out just as a hobby. And he found that there's these planes that are just circling <laughs> over LA. They're just going in circles, right? They lift off, they fly around, and then they circle. Why are there planes circling over LA? And he started to look, what's that? Correct, FBI planes. He's the guy who discovered that these are FBI planes going around, probably using something like Stingray to listen to our phone calls and text messages. Um, so always say, hi, FBI, when you pick up the phone. Um, so RTL-SDR is another really cool example. He did that with RTL-SDR. It's a $20 device. You can use free software, open source software, on your computer, no matter, you know, in any major operating system. Um, GNU Radio, this is like a... This is a fun, although complicated, uh, piece of software um, that it's probably not complicated. It's just really hard for me to learn. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how to use this thing. But it allows you to take radio signals, or actually any signal. Technically, you can just pipe audio into it. And you can manipulate it. You can run different filters on it and extract information or transmit information. So this is another really useful tool. Um, GQRX, this is an awesome tool. We'll actually use this in a minute. Uh, I'll show you how it works. Basically, this allows us to see a waterfall view of the spectrum, of the radio spectrum. So we can say, all right, I want to see from 300 to 301 megahertz. I want to see everything that happens on there. Um, this would allow you to make, let's say you have a device and you don't have the FCC ID. Or let's say you don't have access to a device. Let's say you're outside of something and you have a black box or you know someone's driving up to their garage and they're about to hit a button, but you don't know what frequency their device is using, you can use this to essentially watch, watch a waterfall of radio frequencies. And you will see when there is something with a high amplitude, when there is essentially a signal that's getting transmitted. It's really cool. Um, this is for Linux and OS X only. Uh, if you're on Windows, you can also get SDR Sharp. It's another uh, similar tool to do the same thing. 
very cool. Um, and, and the cool thing is, I mean, there are people out there, like on Reddit, there's a, there's a subreddit called RTLSDR, and you can actually go on there, and people are just looking at the spectrum because there's all these radio frequencies out there, and we have no idea what a lot of them are, right? A lot of these, you know, this is, this is something that's invisible, right? It's essentially invisible to us. And uh, usually when there's something invisible, like people just assume it's secure because we can't see it, we don't know how it works. And more and more people are now playing in this area and researching and trying to find what are all these invisible signals. And a lot of it lacks security. I mean, it's, it's really interesting, some of the stuff that's coming out of here. RTL-FM, um, this is like a command line tool that allows you to record signals with the RTL-SDR. So these are some of the tools that I use. Um, the presentation will be available uh, online, so if you guys want to grab it and, and do any research in here, you, you'll, you'll have access to all of that. So let's go back to this FCC report. Um, there are three things I usually look at when I'm looking at an FCC report for, um, for a device. Uh, internal photos, because that allows me to see inside. If I can see inside, I might be able to make out the chip that's being used. Uh, if I look at the chip, I can probably look up data sheets available for that chip, and I can learn all about what the chip is doing, the frequency it communicates on, the modulation, all sorts of information about it. Um, I can look at the test report as well, and the test report will, will often provide some useful information such as what frequencies it uses, perhaps what modulation, um, and then also the user manual. There's always like incredible pieces of information in user manuals that I find. Uh, a, friend of me, a friend of mine was at Coachella and he's like, yeah, I came back to my car and all my windows were, were down. Um, and I was like, was anything stolen? He's like, no, luckily. I was like, well, so, it's like someone broke into my car and didn't take anything. I was like, ah, that seems weird. So I looked up the FCC ID. I was like, maybe someone hacked his device, his like radio thing, uh, or his, his car key. Um, and I looked, at it, looked it up, and I looked at the user manual, and it's just a section of how the car key operates and everything about the car key. And apparently, if you hold one of the buttons down for enough seconds, all of your windows just roll down. <laughs> um, I haven't told them. I'm going to use it against them. So, <laughs> so here's a, an example of a test report from, a, from my garage door opener. You can, we can see something called the, the frequency is 390 megahertz. We see the modulation type is ASK or ASK. We'll, we'll go over that in a second here. And a couple other things about the device. Um, so let's talk about modulation a little bit. Uh, who here has listened to the radio? OK, cool. Um, younger people may not know what that is. Uh, <laughs> it's like Spotify. Um, so <laughs> we now have things. There, there's different types of modulation. It's basically how we encode data in a signal. There's ASK which is amplitude shift keying. There's uh, FSK, frequency shift keying, and PSK, phase shift keying. These are common modulation schemes that are used. Now, these are specifically for digital data, when you're trying to communicate digital information over, uh, over the radio spectrum. Now, ASK is actually a type of amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation is AM. It's literally AM radio. When you listen to your AM radio, your radio is taking the radio spectrum at whatever frequency you're listening to, um, say 200 kilohertz, and it, the amplitude, which is essentially, if you're listening to, let's say, a sound file, right? The amplitude is the volume. It's essentially how strong that volume is. The amplitude defines where, what kind of sound you're hearing or what frequency the sound is at. Frequency shift keying is frequency modulation, or FM. So FM radio, when you're listening to 102.7, you're actually listening to 102.7 megahertz. And we can use that. We can see that in RTL-SDR. And the frequency is actually not 102.7. It's actually a range. So it's actually more like 102.5 to 102.9. And the frequency changes depending on where, uh, you know, what that sound, what that frequency should be. So in something like RTL-SDR, we can also, if we don't know what a device is transmitting, we can look at it here. And on the left, we see that there's kind of like two signals coming whenever I hit a button. So that's probably something called 2FSK or frequency shift keying, where the frequency is changing. And because it's digital, it's just ones or zeros. So left or right means one or zero. And then on the right, we have ask, which is amplitude shift keying, where it's just either there's a signal or there's not a signal, which represents a one or a zero. So why don't we actually, why don't we actually see what this looks like? Um, I am going to open GQRX, and I'm going to use this RTL-SDR, just so we can take a quick look. Let's see if this works here. All right, so awesome. So we can see here I'm at 300 megahertz, which is what this garage door opener is at. And whenever I press, 
we can see data. So that's pretty cool. Like if, if I didn't know what frequency it was at, we could like go searching through. You know, we could go to, let's say, um, here we, ha we have actual stations, right? So I'm at 100 megahertz now. So we can actually see FM radio stations. And I could actually demodulate this data. I don't know, let's see if that even works. Demod. So we'd have to tune. Oh, yeah. So we can actually tune to different stations here. That's my jam right there. All right, cool. Um, cool, so we actually know that this is at 300 megahertz now. Um, this is really cool. We can demodulate this data right in here. Um, so now that we know it's at, again, we'll, we'll look at it once more here. 300 meg, yep, 300 megahertz. And because it looks like it's just one signal going, turning on and off, that tells me it's probably amplitude shift keying or AM, a amplitude modulation. So we can then use RTLFM. So let me quit that. Uh, let's see here. Find my windows. All right. So, I mean, that's going to be hard to see. But here, I'll just record it first. So I'll say uh, RTL 300 test.wave. I'll press this once or twice. Great, control C. And what this actually does is this produces an audio file, a WAV file that we can then inspect. So I'm going to pull this up in Audacity, a free audio tool. Uh, let me find the file here. And I will throw this in here. All right, cool. So this is Audacity. So here we can see I click, I hit it twice. I hit it once here and then once here. So let's take a look at what this signal actually looks like. Zoom in. It looks like it's a repeating signal. It looks like the same information. Now, who has opened one of these garage doors and had to like set the dip switches? Have you had to do that? All right, so, so we've seen those. Usually it's like 10 or 12 dip switches. So let's zoom in. Can you guess what these relate to? <laughs> <laughs> so if I open mine right here, this thing is impossible to open. All right, now I got it. I'll, uh, I'll tell you what I have here. I have on and off dip switches. Mine is on, on, off, on. Let's just zoom in so we can see if there's any correlation at all. <laughs> on, on, off, on, off, on, off, 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 off. So basically, we're seeing amplitude. We're actually seeing a signal. In this case, it looks like a long signal followed by nothing. Long is a 1. And a short signal followed by nothing is a 0. So literally, just by using this $20 device, I've recorded. And I now know the code to my garage door. You could go around like recording code, like just like in Gone in 60 Seconds, right? They go up to the garage, they use their little device, which probably didn't exist, and they are able to record the code. Like that's so interesting. All right, so let's go back to. Uh, oh man, I can't see anything. All right. I like I like where he's going with that. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to open. Oh, I can't. I'm not mirroring here. Show all windows. Oh, man. Enhance. All right. Back to the slideshow. OK, cool. So we just saw GQRX, and we saw this, right? So we actually analyzed that signal. We saw it was just a repeating signal. It repeats a bunch of times because amplitude shift keying. Like if you've ever listened to AM, the audio sucks. Audio quality sucks. It's it's very easy to. It's the most inexpensive way to transmit information, um, but it's also the most prone to interference. Um, people sniffing. <laughs> you can really sniff anything though. So, someone had a good suggestion. What if we brute force that? Um, how long would it take? Well, if we take a look at it, these different garage doors, uh, there's a couple different things. Um, some are 8 bits. Some are 10 bits. 12 bits. Uh, right? There's just on and off. So. I recorded this one, and it looked like it was 2 milliseconds per bit with a 2 millisecond delay for each bit. Um, and it sent five signals tr per transmission minimum. So if we calculate that uh, for all the possible garage doors that I've looked at that use fixed codes, it looks like it would take about 29, 29 and a half minutes to brute force. So basically 30 minutes to brute force someone's garage, which is pretty insane. Um, so I was looking at this, and I was like, well, can I do this a little faster? Because I have stuff to do. I can't just sit outside of people's homes 30 minutes and do this. And uh, I was looking, and I saw, OK, well, if it's repeating the signal, what if we stop repeating the signal? 
Like it's repeating just so that it can be more successful. But for the most, most part, we're not going to have interference. So if we actually take out the repetition, we can actually reduce it to six minutes to brute force any fixed code garage. That's pretty cool. But looking at this further, I saw that there was basically this massive period of wait uh, of delay between every time it sends a signal. So I was curious, what if I took out that delay where it's sending one signal followed by like one password followed by another password? Instead of a delay in between them, what if I just sent password, 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 password? And that worked. It opened my garage. So that reduced it down to three minutes to open any fixed code garage. And then I was thinking, how does it know where one password begins and one password ends? Um, what if it's using something called a bit shift register? Now, a bit shift register is basically a register where you, you pull in data one bit at a time. And as it's essentially, it performs a test. Let's say it's a four bit register. It looks at the four bits and it performs a test. Is this the correct four bit? If not, it then takes one bit off, pops one off, and then shifts one in. Well, if that's the case, you wouldn't actually need to test all possible codes. You could actually just pop. For example, if I used, let's say, let's say I'm looking at, this is a two-bit code. Let's say we're just looking at a two-bit code right here. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Those are the four options. That's a total of eight bits. However, if we create something called the De Bruyne, De Bruyne sequence, um, De Bruyne is a mathematician who discovered this algorithm to efficiently produce all possible codes over that overlap. So if we overlap these, we can say 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Now, if we put that in a bit shift register, we get 0, 0 as the first two bits. And if we move over just one bit, then we get 0, 1. Move over one bit, we get 1, 1, and then the last 1, 0. So we've actually gotten all eight bits out of a five-bit sequence. Now, if we do that with every 8 to 12-bit code, we actually reduce this down to eight seconds <laughs> to brute force any fixed code garage between 8 and 12 bits long, 8 seconds. Yeah? Mike, this is a hard one. Might this also be a similar premise that would have things like TV be gone? Um, TV be gone, uh, t all, the, all of the infrared codes that are, are basically public information for all the televisions, um, TV be gone, you could do that. But TV be gone specifically turns off TVs. So if you were brute forcing, what you'd actually end up doing is like changing the volume, changing the import source, doing all this other stuff. Um, TV Be Gone specifically has programmed all of the IR codes for, for most of the different televisions. But you could definitely do something similar, because you will hit the off code at some point. right? So at this point, we have eight seconds. Now, this is just how to transmit. RTLSDR does not actually transmit. This is just an assumption of how we can uh, uh, mess with, with this garage. So now we need a device to, to actually transmit. Um, one device I'm a fan of is this uh, Yardstick One, also by Michael Osman. Um, this has a nice radio chip for both re receiving and transmitting. It's not software-defined radio. Software-defined radio allows you to take a, very, uh, a signal you know nothing about and then perform all the modulation, demodulation, and um, accessing and reading it in software. This is all hardware. There, there's pros and cons. The, the con, the major con of something like this is that if you don't know what the signal is, if you don't know if it's frequency modulated or amplitude modulated or the frequency, this is not going to be too helpful because you have to tell this, you have to tell this hardware, I know it's FSK, I know it's on this frequency, I know it's this data rate, and show me the data or transmit the data. But if you know what you're looking for or you know what you want to transmit, you can use this device. And you, there's a Python interface that you can use um, by something called RFCAT. And there's a, uh, another device that um, that I like to use from this, from one of the most amazing technological companies of our time, Mattel. <laughs> so Mattel creates all sorts of awesome toys for children. And one of their devices, one of their toys, is called the Mattel IM Me. Um, this is a texting device for uh, tweens to basically communicate with each other without being on the internet where creepy, creepy people hang out. So with IME, you can actually text someone, and it wirelessly transmits to a little dongle on, on a USB stick. And then it goes over the internet to your friend, who also has one of those USB dongles, and then wirelessly transmits to the, this little device, to the IME. Um, the service is no longer active. They don't sell these anymore, so you can get them off eBay for like $10, $20. And a couple of people have found that inside of this device is a really cool chipset from Texas Instruments. And it's a sub-gigahertz transceiver. That means it can 
receive and transmit on virtually any frequency under one gigahertz, which is actually amazing. If you were trying to build a device like this yourself, it might cost hundreds of dollars. Thanks to Mattel and massive production, you can get it for like 10 bucks on eBay. So uh, Travis Goodspeed and some other people found out that you can connect to the back of this thing and reprogram it and do whatever you want with that transceiver. So this is the device I chose to use for transmitting across all of the different garage frequencies performing this attack. And this is a, I call this the open sesame attack. Um, let's see if it, uh, oh, no. Oh, no. How do we get this to, there should be a video here. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's an example of the open sesame just running on my friend's garage. Um, it takes a total, a max amount of eight seconds, which on average is four seconds. So, awesome. <laughs> uh, one, one step down. Um, so I've released almost everything to do this. Um, obviously, I don't want people breaking into people's garages, so I did not, I bricked the code so that it would not work. However, I released most of it so that people could understand how this type of attack works and also how to, how to prevent it. Uh, unfortunately, since I did that, the prices have raised of the IME. Um, so if you do want one, reach out to me. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to send you one if you're going to do some research in this area, because I bought them before they, they became kind of ridiculously priced. <laughs> so some lessons here. Don't use a ridiculously small key space. Just because it's invisible, right? Just because it's over radio and people aren't looking doesn't mean people aren't going to look, right? At some point, people will look. They will understand the technology. Uh, your proprietary you know, method is not going to help you, so you know, have there's plenty of information on this. Um, require a preamble or sync word, which is basically an, something that says the password's about to start. That would prevent the De Bruyne attack, where you can actually have all of these passwords sort of rolling over each other. And then rolling codes. That's another thing we'll talk about. Um, rolling codes will prevent this type of attack. So now we're inside of the garage. And there's some cool stuff we can do here. One thing that's happening is all of our cars are becoming connected. It's so great. Um, so a lot of new cars now have all sorts of different radios inside. Besides the AM, FM, Sirius, XM radios, um, they have some other things. They often have GSM. Uh, they'll have GPS receivers. And they'll communicate with the internet. Who has OnStar? OnStar? Yeah. So, OK, a lot of you have OnStar and aren't raising your hand. That's OK. Um, <laughs> so actually, any GM vehicle, GMC, Buick, Cadillac, actually has OnStar built in now. You know, whether you activate it or not, it's irrelevant. Uh, you actually have these features. And those features are connected to the computer of the car, the ECU and the various other. Our cars are no longer cars. They're no longer mechanical vehicles, right? They're now essentially a computer with wheels. Um, so the computer controls so much. I mean, we have so many awesome features coming out in our vehicles, like assisted park um, and all of these things. If, if there's something called assisted park, that means the vehicle, the vehicle's computer has control of the wheel, where before it used to be simply mechanical. Um, now it's a computer that's actually able to turn your wheel. So OnStar has a very cool feature. Uh, they have an iOS and Android app. So a friend of mine had, actually with the same car, he, he, had, he had OnStar. And I was playing with this stuff, and he said, you can play with my vehicle if you want. So I was playing with the app. I download OnStar. Um, it does some cool stuff. It lets you see where your car is. Um, lets you do a couple things. There's a key fob access. So you can lock. You can unlock. Remote start. Uh, hit the horns and lights. I tried that a few times while he was driving. But uh, they, they, fortunately, they don't allow you to activate the horn and lights while you're driving, which is smart. Um, so I thought, OK, I'll, I'll check out this communication. I assume it's encrypted. Um, with SSL, so I'll install my own CA, uh, you know, my own certificate authority on my phone, and I'll sniff the traffic. You know, lo and behold, it was encrypted. Um, I installed the CA, and or, or, or I, I usually have my own certificate authority installed on my on my mobile device, and I started sniffing, and because I was do, using my own CA, I could actually perform SSL man in the middle attack. Um, again, this is only on my own, my own device. I can't do this on someone else's because they don't have my certificate authority installed. My certificate authority tells my phone that, oh, Sammy's you know, House of Cards CA is a legitimate authority. You can use his key instead of the legitimate GM or OnStar uh, SSL key. So once I decrypted the traffic, I saw you know, nice HTTPS requests in plain text. I saw some Base64 pulled out the base 64, and of course, the password and username are right there. <laughs> I'm like, OK. 
So make sure to not use you know, the OnStar app on a uh, network that you don't trust. Uh, but as long as, as long as you don't have someone CA, they shouldn't be able to decrypt that traffic. Um, and then I realized I had just reset my iPhone. I forgot like something happened and I reset it. So I actually didn't have my certificate authority installed, which means the app allowed an invalid certificate authority to decrypt traffic even though it had no recognition, it had no idea who Sammy's house of cards was. So the GM app was not looking at an SSL CA. It was blindly, it will take except any SSL key. That means as long as you have someone on your Wi-Fi network, which is very easy to do, and they open that app, you can decrypt all of their traffic for that app. I thought, wow, like, this, is, this is absolutely insane. Um, so I was like, how can I exploit this? And I created a device um, with a Raspberry Pi computer, uh, a Phono GSM board, um, Mallory, which is an open source uh, SSL man in the middle attack software, some DNS spoofing so that the user wouldn't actually detect anything. So I only took over api.gm.com, so anyone using OnStar, but all of their other traffic would still continue to go through the correct servers and correct SSL certificates. Uh, and a couple other things like an alpha wireless card. And then I thought, okay, how do I attack my friend? How do I get him to jump onto my network? Now, fortunately, you can do things like you can use your own, uh, or you can use common Wi-Fi network names, like ATT Wi-Fi or Starbucks, uh, things that you know that they might be on. But there's actually something pretty cool here. Another thing that our phones do is they send out probe requests. So if your phone doesn't see your network, it will actually send out probe requests saying, hey, I'm looking for a network, in this case, named Tadong. Is there a network named Tadong out here? And you can say yes. It actually tells you the network name it's looking for. And with that information, you can generate a network on the fly, which it will then join, assuming that it's the correct network. It's actually our phones, our devices, our computers, our laptops, none of them actually look at the MAC address. They're only looking at the network name. Now, this is only for open networks. If, if your phone has only connected to encrypted networks, fortunately, this attack will not work. But I'm assuming almost everyone has at least connected to one open, uh, unencrypted network before. ATT Wi-Fi on almost all iPhones. ATT Wi-Fi on almost all iPhones, absolutely. Netgear links this. I mean, you can, and, and the cool thing is you can just launch all of them, right? So if, if you come near my house, you may actually just see like 10 different network names for all the common ones. <laughs> so with under $100, we have, um, uh, a little device that I threw under my friend's car and uh, <laughs> was able to, you know, at some point, well, let's see, OwnStar, yes, yeah, so this, this is an app called OwnStar now. So here I am, and, and once I acquired his credentials, I was then able to unlock his car, remote start it, and basically do anything to his car at that point. Um, and then I tested BMW, which also did not check SSL certificates, and then I checked in Mercedes-Benz, which did not check SSL certificates. And then I tested Chrysler Jeep, which did not t test SSL certificates. This is a massive issue in virtually every, I'd say this was like five out of 10 of the uh, car apps that have the ability to unlock a vehicle, right? I only cared about the apps that actually did something you know, important. Five of 10 did not perform SSL CA validation. So the lessons here, if you're gonna do this, either validate certificates from a CA which actually I wouldn't necessarily suggest anymore. Um, the nice thing about CA is you can like turn off your keys if they ever get stolen. However, there are a lot of certificate authorities out there. For example, like I don't know, you wouldn't want the Hong Kong you know, post to be releasing CAs or releasing keys for you, but they have that full capability. They can say they own gmail.com if they want. Um, and we've seen, we've seen CAs get hacked before um, or accidental keys for gmail.com get released before. So better yet, use certificate pinning. This way, your, the, the app that you release has a key in it. You have that key. Those are the only people who know about this key. No one else can you know, avoid that. Um, also, hash the passwords. Like, don't just base 64 everything, right? Hash your passwords. Use assault. Make it difficult, even if someone does obtain this information. Who knows how someone will break into your device sometime in the future? There will be new attacks. They will extract information in different ways. And always assume you're on a hostile network. Just always assume that. So now we've broken into some cars. Um, we'll go through this. Uh, now, there's another interesting thing that I've seen a lot of these vehicles use. And a lot of the key fobs, they all use something called rolling codes. 
So rolling code is like we talked about before with the CEA. Uh, the code actually changes every time, kind of like 2FA. You get a different SMS message, or your Google Authenticator sends you a different number every time. And that's great. That's actually a really good way to prevent an attack like the, key, uh, like the garage door attack, right, Open Sesame, where we have a fixed code. Also, rolling codes are much, much longer. They're not like silly 12-bit codes that you can break in a couple of seconds. So that's a, that's a nice thing. I'll quickly run through some um, hardware attacks that, uh, if you're ever looking at hardware that you don't know, some of the devices I was looking at, I was actually finding that they would actually mark the chip off. They would actually scratch off the name so they couldn't look up the data sheet and see what, what it was using. Um, so in that case, what I use is, I use a couple of things. I use a logic analyzer. Logic analyzer just looks at looks at information, looks at digital information going on a wire. So you can connect pins to each of these pins. Um, I use these SMD micro, these micro probes so I can connect to like really small, uh, really small pins off of chips. Uh, I also use a, a multimeter. Um, you can measure voltage with the multimeter off different, different pins on a chip. And when I'm looking at a chip that I don't know anything about, I'll start mapping it out. I can use the multimeter to find the ground and to find power. So I can mark all the ground and power pins. Um, also, I can use the logic analyzer, and I can look for certain things that look like a clock signal. A clock signal will just look like a square wave or pulse width modulation. Um, once I do that, if I know what frequency it's communicating on, which I should be able to learn with something like an RTL-SDR or HackRF, I can then download all the data sheets I can find for something that does that. Let's say it's communicating on 2.4 gigahertz. I will download all the data sheets of transceivers on 2.4 gigahertz, and then I'll take all of their pinout pages, and I'll look at them, and I'll compare. Do any look similar to what I have? Do any have the same number of pins? Do any have the grounds in the same places, the voltage in the same places, the clock in the same place? And if so, I've now discovered what chip that, that device is being used, despite them trying to you know, scratch it off. Um, using the logic analyzer and data sheet, I can see how that chip is communicating with the device, what commands it's sending. Then I'll learn all sorts of other information, like if there's Encryption. Uh, I might learn a key. I might learn, you know, what it's what it's using. Um, I can extract all the serial communication, how it communicates with that device, and I can then build an interception device, um, which is pretty fun. So, uh, at this point, let's take a look at my car. Um, my car uses something called rolling codes. Now, if you look at this, there's a ton more data in this code. So this would actually take years and years and years to brute force. Uh, and it's only good once. So as soon as you use this code, it will never work again. So when I hit the kick clicker on my car to unlock, that code is used, and my car knows that this code is no longer valid, which is great. So well, let's understand how rolling codes work. There's basically a random number generator in your car and in your key. And they're synced. Um, there's actually like a rolling window. So when you press the unlock button, your car expects that unique identifier, that unique code. But now that the car has heard it, it says, I will never accept that again. So if someone was sitting out, if Nicolas Cage was outside of your home, and he like sniffs this identifier, and he tries to use it later on to replay, it's not going to work. Because the car says, oh, I've seen that code before. I will not accept it. I will only accept the next code. Um, and there's a rolling window. So in case, you know, in case the, the key is in your, in your pocket, and you hit it a bunch of times out of range of the car, then you go back to the car. The car will say, oh, you're actually out of range, but it's OK. You know, you're, all, you're in the future, right? You're not using a past code. You're just a little bit in the future. You probably hit the button accidentally a few times. That's OK. Now, that's only a small window, so it's, it's hard to uh, use that to attack. So I was trying to find ways of replaying rolling codes, of attacking that. The, only, you know, the major way I could think of was the only way is to capture a signal while you're out of range of the car. So if you like break into someone's house, take their car, hit the button, record it, and then go back later, and then replay it. Now, all of, most cars these days also use this for starting the vehicle as well. So these attacks are actually not only for unlocking vehicles, but also starting. Um, now, this is a really lame attack. I think if you're in their house and you have access to their key, you should just take it. Um, so how can, we, how can we get around this? What if we jam, what if we jam the code? Now, Again, these keys are inexpensive, so they're—I mean—they'll charge you like three hundred dollars to buy one, but they're actually really cheap. Um, so it's a, it's actually very easy to interfere with this communication. So when someone hits their button, if you're actually transmitting as well, in fact, if you even have the same a similar key and you hold down the unlock or lock button of your key while someone tries to unlock their car, they won't be able to unlock their car. You can actually do this for kind of a wide range. Um, it's kind of funny to watch. Uh, 
but you can basically easily interfere with this communication. So worst case scenario, they might have to like pull out their key. Now, who has hit their button of their key and it didn't work once? That happens, right? And you just hit it again and it typically works, right? There was some interference or you didn't hold it long enough. So what if I jam just slightly off, just slightly off the frequency and I also listen? I also use a similar device to listen. I can actually be very specific and listen to just that signal and listen to their code and ignore my jamming. Because I know where I'm jamming, I can ignore that piece of the, the signal. The problem is, once I've recorded that signal that the car has not heard, I can use that signal now. I can use it to unlock. However, they're going to keep hitting it until it works. And when it works, when the car does hear their unlock code, all previous codes get disabled. So the code that I've acquired is now no longer useful. However, as we're human, we all follow a simple pattern. If I jam and I listen and I get one code and I keep jamming, so you go up to your car, you, you hit unlock, it doesn't work. You hit unlock again, it doesn't work, two times in a row. But I've listened to both codes and I've extracted those two passwords. I now take those two and I only replay the first one. So now the car does unlock on the second time, but I'm using the first code. So later on when you go home and you lock your car, I still have an unused future code that I can unlock your vehicle. <laughs> because there's actually no timing, right? It's all about just the order of the sequence of these codes. So you can essentially trick the user by playing the first one on their second time. And of course, you can automate this. Um, so this is a, an attack I call uh, Roll Jam. I've demonstrated with about $30 in hardware. And there's so many other attacks in this area. I mean, it's such an, it's, I think it's such an exciting area because you have cars coming out this year in 2016 that will actually communicate with other vehicles on the road. It's called V2V. -V. So there's so much other radio communication that's going to be happening. Um, you know, cars are able to use ultrasound to see if there's something in front of them. But what if you send your own ultrasound, right? What, I mean, you can generate ultrasound. It's just sound at a higher frequency. What if you send that to a vehicle? You can make it believe that someone is in front of you. You can, you can send communication to cars saying that, oh, it's, it's really rainy, so slow down. You can just make everyone slow down around you. I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, it's crazy, and it's scary, and it's exciting. Uh, there's, so, there's so many other interesting attacks. Um, I was also looking at my, at my car, and I found that if they're locking the vehicle, if they're hitting lock, 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 and I record that data or inter interfere with that data, well, I can't use a lock to, like, that's no good. I can't, what, what fun is locking their car? However, I found in the signal, as I was looking at the data sheet, I found that the rolling code is one part, and then the command is a second part. So I could change the command from lock to unlock and use the same code. As long as I jammed and inter interfered their lock command, then I can use that lock command to unlock. So even though I hit, they hit lock, later on I come over, I send, I send an unlock just by changing that bit, because it's just a command not tied to the code in any way. Um, here's the, the device itself. I tested on a lot of cars, it unlocked a lot of cars, and it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, lessons, I mean, in, you know, encrypt, hash those buttons together. So if, if you're sending a lock command, for example, and of course this, this works anywhere, this will work on HTTP, like you should use these same, uh, these same methods. Um, encrypt, that, encrypt or hash that communication together, right? Hash the key, hash the key with the uh, command. Um, use HMAX, uh, time-based algorithms. There's actually something called, uh, I mean, we've had Secure ID for 20 years now, right? Those RSA, RSA tokens, which uh, are essentially 2FA. We've had those for 20 years. And every 2015 car I've attacked has had this issue. Um, we can implement this stuff. This stuff exists. We know about these, we know about these problems, and we know how to solve them. Um, also, you can do challenge response right, with transceivers rather than just cheap receivers. So there are ways of fixing this. Um, and you know that, that's that's about it. That's that's what I have for you. Um, thanks so much for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, happy to take any questions. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Yes. Did you report any of those uh, apps that accepted whatever? I reported all of them. Yeah, I communicated what with it. What did they do? They all, well, fortunately they all came out with new apps. Um, well, the first one, GM, did not re reach out. I mean, it was impossible to contact them. They had no like, uh, um, they had no way for researchers to reach them. Uh, so I called them. <laughs> I went to the support. I escalated. I emailed. Uh, I went through their website. I mean, literally never heard back. And then uh, I 
then I released a demonstration. I didn't release the code or anything. Uh, and then I got called the, you know, like within 24 hours. <laughs> and then Benz, BMW, et cetera, they all uh, did fix. I mean, everything, everyone fixed it within a few days, which is great, because it was just an app update. Yes? Uh, none of them had, none of them had bounty programs, oh, and none of them had security presences that I could actually communicate with. It was literally, I mean, literally all of these companies, I had to just, uh, they had no security response, right? This is this is new areas, at least for the vehicles. Um, now GM does. Now GM does have a security program. Does Chrysler also have? I'm sure they do. <laughs> yes. Correct. So then how is it that you recorded two codes for the jam, and then you let them unlock your car, and then you still had a code? Because, so this is the, this is the device. Um, I have a, a, actually a, a new device I've created that's smaller and cheaper. This is $30, and you put it under their car. So it always has the next code. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you just, it literally, they have to press the button twice every time. And we adapt pretty quickly. We just get used to it, right? Now you just hit it twice. You're like, <laughs> works the tw second time every time. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, absolutely, that's a great idea. Yeah, actually, you could do that. So you only need to inconvenience them once. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. So it's a successful field test with that? Correct. Yes, many, many field tests. <laughs> <laughs> You'll actually see the, the lot is like half empty now. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Did you look at all the uh, you talk about the most frequently used method that I've heard of for breaking the cars? Is the amplification method? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the amplification attack is really interesting, right? A lot of us have keys that we keep in our vehicle, or we keep in our pocket, and we can go up to our car, pull the door, and it'll send a signal out that our key detects, and then it will perform a challenge response back. Right, and for starting the car, it actually uses the signal strength, so it knows that you're in the car. So if the signal strength is too low, it says, oh, you're outside of the car, I'm not gonna start the vehicle. You have to be inside the car. But, as you say, you can perform an amplification attack, where you actually Let's say you have two people, right? And you go up to the car, you pull the door, it sends the signal, your device amplifies that signal or sends it wirelessly somewhere else. That gets retransmitted near the door or near the, near the person's car key in a restaurant or outside of their house. And yeah, you can then unlock and start their vehicle and drive away. And vehicles cannot stop if they detect the key is no longer in the car. It would be too dangerous, right? If you're on the freeway or something, what happens? So the car will continue to go and you take it to your chop shop. Yes. Have you found uh, whether or not the uh, time response protocols uh, use the mechanism to get per, uh, protect proximity based on the timing of the response? So if you're doing this relay attack, it's going to take longer than the vehicle. That's correct. Uh, all, all of them do have some amount of timing, um, but it's lax enough that you can perform the attack in every case that I've seen. Yes. Do you recall this excellent research from Missouri? Mm. Yes? Were there any uh, vehicles you had the opportunity to test that you weren't able to get something like this working on? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all, you know, vehicles, they're, they're all using some of the same chipsets from the same companies, um, so it's all the same attack. Yeah? So where do you think this goes? I mean, these, these protocols are pathetic, right? They're mm -hmm. like, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I feel like this is, you know, I, I think we were talking about it earlier. Like, this is the web 10 years ago, right? 10, 15 years ago, everything had XSS, everything had SQL, you know, SQLI, everything had RFI. Now, only most things <laughs> have XSS <laughs> and SQLI and RFI. So I think in another 10 years, hopefully, we'll have a lot more hardware and radio security. I hope so. Yeah, I, I suspect we will. Yeah. Uh, that was a different, that was someone else, yeah. Yes? Is there a related question? Do you have any insight as to why this happens? Like, where is the company that's trying to get security people? Like, uh, where I work, we find a garage that has... What security people? Yeah, what's that? Yeah. No, no, seriously, I, I don't think they have security people. I'm sure they don't, 
uh, I, I think that's a new thing, right? Yes. Oh, interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. That's very cool. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much, everyone.